Good afternoon. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Nice Apple's Young Professionals Committee's panel discussion on road to licensure. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple items to make sure you all understand how the discussion will work. Similar to our webinar process, on the screen you will have a screenshot of what the GoToWebinar dashboard looks like. Um, using the raise your hand feature, which is right here, um, let's do a quick sound check to make sure that you guys can hear me. So if you can hear me, please click raise your hand. And while we are waiting for some hands to go up, I'd like to remind you that we cannot hear you. So if you have a question, please use the question box on your dashboard to type in your questions. At any time during the program, use this box to send in your comments and questions and the committee will address them as needed. All right, so it looks like um, most of your hands are up. I am going to turn everything over to our Young Professionals Committee Chair, Tim Massey. Hi, Tim. Tim, I'm sorry, you're muted. I'm muted and unmuted. How are we feeling? Are. we good? Yes. All right. Uh, happy lunch, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great day and a happy Friday. It's at least here down on Long Island, we're, we've got some sunny skies, and I hope the same is for, for everybody out there. Um, excited to have everybody with us. Today, we are, uh, we're taking the opportunity um, to speak about the road to licensure. Uh, there's some folks out there that are looking to get licensed. Um, there's some folks on this panel who were just recently licensed, myself included. Um, so we're hoping to allow you guys to learn from our experiences and we're also looking forward to, to taking some of your questions. Um, one of the things that we have, as Heather mentioned, we have that chat box. Heather is going to be moderating for us. So if you guys have any questions on what we have uh, that comes up, shoot them right out. We'll get those answered. And if there's anything we don't touch, um, we're going we're gonna to grab all that stuff at the end and cover as many questions and answers as we can at the, uh, towards the back half of uh, the presentation. Um, again, if you're not familiar with the Young Professionals Committee, uh, this is your committee in front of you. Uh, we have uh, one member who couldn't join us, Jay, uh, but these are the folks who are on the committee having those conversations to understand what it is that you guys are looking for. Um, we have a bunch of conversations to try to figure out what that is, and this is this is one of the little babies that came out of those conversations. So uh, a big thing that's helpful to us, and I ask you all, um, at the end of this, you're going to get a survey. I know how easy it is to just click through that survey and just go five 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 five, which I'd like you to do. But I we would love it if you had an op took the opportunity to add your comments, tell us what you liked, tell us what you didn't like. And what could we do for you in the future? Um, that's what we're here for. That's what the association is here for. And we really want to make sure that we can capture that stuff for you guys. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it so you guys can get questions out to us. Um, we're, as we go through this, we're going to introduce each one of our members. My name is Timothy Massey. I work at National Grid. Uh, I run the downstate region of survey for the company. Um, I have just been recently licensed. My license, I got my paperwork in uh, a month ago. So my whole experience is pretty fresh, and I'm hoping that I can add some, uh, some content to the conversation today. Um, I've been surveying for 15 years now. I'm so excited to, uh, excited to chair this committee and excited for everybody on here to have an opportunity to talk about it. I am going to start out with what are the requirements that we're looking at when we talk licensure? Um, there's a lot of things that your mentors, and hopefully you all have one, a mentor or the folks who you're working for have come before you, that they're experienced. And some of those regulations have changed recently. And I'm going to uh, ask Nick Ford, who we have on the line here, um, to just give us a little background on yourself. And also, if you can just jump into uh, what those license requirements are and how they've been changing. Sure, no problem. As Tim said, my name is uh, Nick Ford and uh, I was licensed also fairly recently, uh, definitely related to most surveyors. 
by licensure was 2017. I'm an Alfred State graduate, graduated around 2012. And then after getting licensed, I was able to land a job teaching full-time at Alfred State. So that's what I've been doing for the last few years. And one of the things that we're really interested in at Alfred is this land surveyor education bill, which has passed as, and is in effect. So as many of you are aware, you can earn the necessary experience to get your license after eight years of quality experience in the field. Other states have education requirements, and this is New York's attempt to have one of those education requirements. So with the passing of this bill, in order to become a licensed land surveyor, you're going to need a bachelor's degree in land survey. There are exceptions that are possible, such as associate's degrees in land surveying or degrees in similar programs that incorporate surveying into them. Um, but those would require approval from the Board of Education. So this officially went into effect a month ago, month and a couple weeks ago on April 3rd. But there is an eight year grace period. So as long as you have been working towards experience since before April 3rd, you will still be able to get your license. But once April 3rd, 2029 comes around, that path is going to close. That is no longer going to be an option. And that's a, that's a great point, Nick, and thank you very much. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a big point of uh, knowledge for folks. That experience pathway, if you have been working in surveying, your window closes on what day was that, Nick? Uh, the 3rd of April of 2029. 2029. So if you could do nothing else before 2029, make sure you get that license in. So thank you very much, Nick. Um, I would say that most everybody on this panel would agree that the, the next topic is probably one of the hardest things that you're going to have to accomplish during uh, your licensure, and that is your application. Um, hopefully some of you on the line have had the opportunity to uh, get involved in your application and start to see what that process looks like. Um, we have Jason Peterson on the on the line. Um, Jason's going to speak to us about his experience in doing the application and what it felt like um, through the experience route. Jason, you want to you want to chime in and and give us a quick rundown on your uh, where you are in your career and uh, touch on that for us. Absolutely. Um... I'm Jason Peterson. I'm the owner of Bethlehem Land Surveying. I was licensed in 2012 and getting into surveying, I just happened to pretty much fall into it. I was discharged from the Marine Corps in 1995 and somebody happened to ask me in 1996, you know, upon one of their roommates being fired from a land surveying company, do you want to be a land surveyor? You want to work at this survey company and not knowing anything about it i decided yeah that sounds good to me and here i am 2021 owning my own company decided to stick with it it just became one of those things that you you, you just know when you want to do it and i'm assuming that it, since everybody's logged on that this is the path that they are choosing for their career so as far as the application for experience only, it's, it's very important to maintain um, great records of your experience because when you go to apply and fill out that application, you're going to have to have all those, the licensed individuals that you worked under attest to the experience that you state on your application with all the hours broken down into the different categories that they're gonna require, you know, your field experience, your office experience, your managerial experience, uh, everything that's uh, uh, required to get your license and you're gonna to have to account for all those hours and then you're gonna to have to go back to those professionals and have them attest to that experience. So it's very important 
to maintain all of those those records and um, I'm, I'm sure as we go on through this discussion we'll get into how to craft such a an application but um, that's the thing that you need to do is just make sure that you document everything that you've done and maintain those records eight years is a long time to maintain them so um, if if this is the path that you choose you got eight years to to figure out exactly how you want to document it and reach back out to, to those individuals that you worked under and have them attest to your experience. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. And I, and I would definitely agree because I, too, um, took the experience route to licensure. And I had the benefit of having uh, stayed in contact with all of the uh proprietors that I had worked with prior. So it made it a little bit easier, but let me tell you, uh, I know some folks that can be real tough. So if you can keep track of who you've worked for during your surveying career, it'll make life a lot easier when this application process comes through. Now, I'm gonna have yeah. Nick speak yeah, to his... Too. There, that's, there's a good point right there. Um, I'm gonna throw this over to Nick because Nick has a very different application experience than I had. And uh, I think it would benefit everybody to hear hear how he addressed that uh, as well. Nick, you want to take that away? Yeah, sure. Um, so I went school route. I got my four-year degree at Alfred. Um, I took my FS exam two years after I graduated. And having that experience, I always make sure to tell students about that and say, don't do what I did. Take your FS exam as soon as possible. Um, but then I went through my professional career and you know keeping track of my employers was pretty easy for me because i just had one employer throughout that time period and what i worked on primarily was residential boundary surveys and i was in charge of everything from research to field work to completing the map in the office so i had well-rounded experience and when it came for describing my experience and creating my application i ended up writing a one-page paper I started out with my basic responsibilities. I talked about how I've done probably hundreds of boundary surveys up to this point. And then I went into specific details on one particularly interesting survey and talked about the different aspects because it was a survey that covered lots of different topics and ideas that a surveyor would have to deal with. And that was it. Um, my employer, the people that I worked with, thought I was crazy for submitting such a short application, but it did get the job done. I can't say that it'll work for everyone, but if you have that kind of experience, maybe it's something not to stress too much about. Yeah, that's great. It's it's definitely a unique one that I heard uh, for the first time. And and Matt, do you have, uh, you have something to add to that as well? Yeah, what, um, hi, my name is Matt Palmer. I work for BME Associates out of Rochester. I've been licensed since 2015 and I kind of had the same kind of route as Nick except for I took my FS after two years of Alfred because down in Pennsylvania you can take it after a two-year degree um, or if you're in or through two years of a four-year degree and it's because it's a national test it doesn't matter what state you take it in so I drove down to Penn State and I took it down there and most of the stuff that's on the test is stuff you learned the first couple of years of school. So, you know, it was still kind of fresh in my mind, which I thought made it a lot easier to pass. Yeah, that's great. And I, let me tell you, if there was a, uh, if there was a piece of advice that I've picked up along the way, speaking to surveyors, it is, if you are in a survey program, do not put off taking the FS. Um, I just did mine now in my mid thirties. And I can promise you that going back and relearning and doing all that math after years of not having to do it um, definitely wasn't as easy as it could have been um, had we uh, had I done it earlier in career. So, um, Ashley, Ashley Metz on the line. Hopefully, you've had an opportunity. Everyone on the line has had an opportunity um, to review our women's summit that was provided in during the state conference. Ashley, you might recognize as the moderator of that conversation, um, who is also a member of the Young Professionals Committee. Um, Ashley, you are, I don't want to say the beginning of your career, but you are on the path to licensure. Um, is there anything that comes up during the application process that you've seen that there's any, any questions on? 
Yeah, absolutely. So my name's like uh, Tom, Tim said, I'm Ashley Metz, and I've been lancering for about three years at this point. I started in high school just as a, an intern, basically, and fell in love with the career. And ever since then, I've been working towards my license. I uh, went to the ranger school for two years, and then I just went right into um, working, you know, in the field and in the office in any way I could. But as I started to look into becoming licensed, there was this one thing that just kept coming back um, during part of the application, which was what they call a res responsible charge. And uh, it just, it didn't really make sense to what I could call responsible charge or what I could consider my work being. And I was hoping somebody here could answer that for me because I really, I don't know where to go. Hey, Mike, what do you think? That sounds right up your alley. Thanks, Tim. My name is Mike Lewis. I'm with uh, GDB Geospatial down on Long Island in Melville. Um, I started surveying in 1998, in May of 98, actually. So this is uh, something I've been doing for a while. Um, I got licensed in 2012, similar to uh, what others have already said. I did the experience route. Um, I kind of did everything that has been spoken about. Don't do this, do it that way. Record this, record that. I, I fell into that trap of having to remember at the time what I had been doing for the last 13 or 14 years, trying to gather all the hours, get all the experience. Um, I was lucky to only have worked for two separate employers, so I didn't have to track down too many people. Um, Similar to Nick, I had done a lot of boundary survey. I didn't really know what to put down on my application. And when it came to the responsible charge part of it, um, I had to actually sit and say to myself, um, you know, what is responsible charge? Well, responsible charge means that you're in control and direction of either survey work or engineering work. If you have a license, you could be looked at as the engineer of record or the surveyor of record, but as a party chief, or an office manager, you need to be able to take direction from the LS or from the PE um, and, and direct a field crew, direct an office crew, do the research, know that the research that you are you are obtaining is is correct. Can you backtrace a deed? Can you can you read a deed when you're at the clerk's office and, and say, you know what, this really doesn't make sense with what I expected to see. I might have to go back a few a few deeds. Is this map something that I can work with? Um, you're, you're in control and you're directing the work. And that's what the board kind of wants to see. They understand that from day one, you didn't go into this profession day one knowing how to be a party chief. You start out as an instrument operator or you start out as a, as a rod man on a crew. But through the years, you work your way up to that level of responsible charge where now you can at the very least uh, direct the field and office operations with, with um, I don't want to say minimal input from the, from the licensed professional, but um, with, with certain direction that he can trust, you can, you can take his, his instructions and, and relay them out. Yeah, that's great, Mike. And I think, that, I think that last piece is really the key there, is getting to a point where you can anticipate what your licensed surveyor or what your project manager is looking for. That's when you start identifying what responsible charge really is. Uh, I think it's a, a great way to look at it too. Uh, we had a question come in, which is great, um, from Darren, looking for how does out-of-state experience count for sitting for the, the New York State exam? And I think we have, Jason, if I recall, you uh, spent some time in Florida at the beginning of your career. Can you speak to that, how that, how that factored in? Absolutely. So. Like I said, when I was discharged from the Marines, I started surveying and it was and it was in Florida. And when you go to apply, you are just you're listing the experience that you have. Now, with the, the first two parts of taking your land surveyors exam, with them being national exams, you know, the national part. That's where that experience comes has its value because you're starting to show your overall roundedness uh, and I, I can't even express uh, express this uh, how important this is to show uh, how rounded your experience is 
with the differences of these two land systems, me starting in Florida, but uh, becoming licensed in New York. These are completely different um, land systems, but the value is uh, extreme. It, there, there's a lot of value in having had that experience with those two because they're part of the exam, but it has just as much value wherever, if you worked in Florida, it has just as much value as if you worked in New York or you know, vice versa as you get into some of the, your, the, uh, the minutia of your, your application, your construction experience. All of that is experience and it's all evaluated by a board and they'll they'll put the, the weight and value on it as necessary, but it shows how well-rounded you are. So no matter which state you get your experience in, it's your experience underneath a licensed land surveyor or engineer underneath a licensed individual that all has value. Perfect. And I think that's that really is a, a great way um to address it is that the experience is your experience um what the board really wants to make sure of is that you are cognizant that there are differences and how as to the way jason spoke of it the diversity of your experience can help support your knowledge base and showing how how your knowledge and experiences have crafted where you are at this point in your application. Um, one of the questions that we just got in from Mike, um, are there sample applications that one can follow as far as the format? This is a question that I will host because the, big, the biggest thing about your application, and, and anybody who's on this call can, can chime in, Think of your application not as an application. Think of your application as a report in which you are showing, not proving, but you are showing the board that you have a certain level of not just knowledge of surveying, but also of professional experience. Craft your application to fit your experience. Now, what does that mean? As you've heard, there's some folks on here that have been, um, that have gone the experience only route. There's some folks who have worked for multiple, uh, multiple surveyors. There's folks who went through school. Everyone's experience is a little bit different. So, there's two sections that are required in your application. There is, hey, what are your, what's your job title and what did you do? In those job titles and the next one is tell us about some of what you know how you address those is really going to be dependent upon how how your career has progressed for instance I spent time at three different uh, three or four different surveyors during the course of my career what I was able to do is I broke my application down into the places I worked and then I picked two or three projects from each client, from each company, to then explain what my work, specifically what your work was on the project. And be clear, concise about it. Speak about it as if you were a surveyor. Um, the board wants to know that you understand what a benchmark is, where the benchmark was derived from. They don't necessarily need a definition of what a benchmark is. They don't necessarily need a definition of how you run, how you do a level run, but they do want to know that you understand how all these different components work. And a level run might be a little basic here, but I hope you can understand what I'm getting to. Um, they don't need the calculations of the boundary. They need to know that you can calculate a boundary. And that's really where you're going to craft um, craft uh, your application. Now, having said that, it can be very difficult to get started. I know for me, I wrote draft after draft trying to understand what format I was going to do it in. If you're having trouble, talk to some people. Find out who has a similar experience to you and how they address that. Um, don't have to recreate the wheel, 
you can have, you can help learn from from others. So that would be my my advice. There is there anybody here on the call that has had some more advice uh, regarding um, how they formatted their application? If you ask your boss, he probably has his application in a drawer somewhere. You can just ask him. Yep. Uh, I've got mine in a drawer right here, so everybody's got it because it <laughs> spent a year putting it together. So you sure did, and I and I think that's a big, that's a good thing to to reinforce with folks. Talk to anyone who has filled out the survey application. It's not easy. It's difficult. It takes time. Um, like I started this off with, I personally feel it was probably the hardest part of the entire process, um, getting that application together. Um, one of the questions that pops up is, what are what happens when no when somebody's not around to sign your work? Uh, the way in which the application uh, phrases the signatories is someone who can speak can attest to your reasonable charge. So should your should the surveyor you worked for uh, no longer be around, deceased, whatever the case may be, you can move to a project manager that you worked with um, or another LS in the company that can that can sign off on that. So that is an option for um, when someone is not around. Uh, it does get a little trickier. I know uh, I've heard some, some fun stories about that. But um, speaking of, so now we are through our application process. We're getting jobs. We're making sure that we are on the path to becoming licensed. One of the questions that pops up, and I'm going to have Matt uh, speak to this, is what should we be looking for? Are there certain things? Are there certain companies? One of the things that we all, um, and I know newer surveyors coming out of school are concerned with, is they hear that big companies are going to pigeonhole them into doing one specific thing, and they're not going to get enough experience. Or if you work for a small company, you're you're going to end up um, you know, doing everything. And I, I know for myself, having spoken to a lot of people, it doesn't matter what size company you work for. It matters the quality of the people that you work with. Um, Matt, can you speak to what you should be looking for in an employer or, you know, your met, hopefully a mentor? Yeah. Um, when, when you're, you feel like you're, you're going to get stuck in doing just like all right away work, and stuff and you know well you can't count all that for your for your application so you gotta you gotta be an advocate for yourself talk to your your bosses and say hey i want your license which they're gonna love because they it's gonna show that you know you actually care about the work and you you know work hard and so you gotta kind of say well can you put me on some of these boundary jobs or can i stay in the office and maybe do some research or some seed calcs and um it doesn't matter the size big or small and i think any um, any boss is going to just love that because it's showing that you, you're actually taking initiative. And um, especially if you talk about that, if you're in an interview or something and you talk about wanting to get your license at some point, uh, it's going to be, you're going to be a leg up for some other people who just want to, you know, sit behind the gun all day. Well, Great. How about you, Mike? What do you, what would you look for to, if you were moving to a new employer as a, as a, as a student? Um, it's, well, one of the things that we do here, um, when, when we interview people, we kind of ask the question, especially if they come into a lot of experience, do you have a desire to be licensed or do you have a desire to just kind of be a party chief, which there's nothing wrong with not wanting to get a license. If I was going to a new employer, um, similar to what has been mentioned, I would want to know what kind of diverse projects do you does this company work on? Uh, again, I came from the small residential side of things, and then I jumped into this big municipal company side of things. Um, so one of the things that I would want to know is, do you just do boundary work? The, the, you know, do you get involved in any control network stuff? You know, it's not to say that you just have to do boundary. You know, we do a lot of control network stuff here. The board wants to know that you can, as you said, you know, don't define what a traverse is, but can you run a linear traverse and figure out if it closes or not? Um, you know, can you can you perform uh, you know a GPS campaign and do some static and rapid static and RTK type work? Um, I would want to know that. I would want to know 
Is there is there an opportunity to not just be pigeonholed into office or field, become a hybrid? Uh, you know, rainy days and snow days, do you want to be pounding steaks in the frozen ground up north, or do you want to do some of that office research? And we kind of we kind of look to to, to um, with some of the employees here that are looking to get licensed, we try to direct them in such a way that listen, we've got this big you know, right away project coming up, we think if you want to get licensed, you should be doing some field work on it, but you should be doing some office work on it. Closing deeds, coming up with closure reports, things like that is what you may want to uh, ask a potential employer is um, nothing wrong with just doing boundary all day long, even stakeout work. Um, you know, they say, oh, stakeout work doesn't count for much on the, well, guess what? If you're laying out a subdivision, you want to know where those boundaries are, right? You want to know how to lay out the, the lot corners. Uh, you're not just laying out curbs and drainage. You're going to be establishing the lots on that map. It counts for something. Ask those kinds of questions too. Absolutely, I think that's a great that's yeah, a great point. I'm looking at the, um, go right I'm looking at the requirements right now for um, for experience, and it does say you know stake out and line and grade surveyed to not provide adequate training themselves. But um, it says if you're working under the direction of a licensed land surveyor, the board may, in its discretion, consider granting credit. So it's all about how you word it in your application. Like, if you just say you've been, you know, throwing lats in the ground, they're probably not going to like it. But if you're saying you're doing calcs and you're, um, you know, working things in the field, it'll make it a little better. Yeah. Hey, Nick, um, I'm sure you have some advice for, for your students who are coming out of your, uh, out of the Alfred State program. Um, I'm sure they're, based around making sure that you become a well-rounded surveyor. Anything specific? Uh, well, I was just listening to Mike talk and I agree with pretty much everything he had to say. That's the kind of stuff that I want students to be aware of, uh, making sure they're asking the right questions, making sure they're talking in their interview about what kind of work uh, and what kind of projects they'll be working on in their career at this particular company, whatever company that may be. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think it's, I think something that sometimes gets lost in the conversation is when you're having those conversations with people discussing surveying, make sure you're talking about surveying. Um, there are times where we will work on, hell, we'll, we'll do a, a big survey of an environmental project or we'll do a big survey of an exciting engineering project. Make sure that when you're speaking surveying, you speak survey. Um, Oftentimes, we can get caught up in other aspects of the project um, that catch our attention. But in the realm of application and the realm of uh, applying for serving, make sure that you're staying specific. So um, we have on the line one of the people who I I look uh, I look at as a as a excellent student at this point based on the, the fact that not only has, has he gotten degrees but also has gone back and gotten more degrees and has probably studied more in his life than I ever will. Um, Keith, could you touch on some of the items that you've learned along the way in your different degrees and going back to school that you could share just as general study tips? Um, some of the things that you've looked at because I know you're in the you're in the thick of it all right now. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Keith Burley. I work for March Engineering in Canago, New York, Free Lakes area. Um, I went back to school after getting into surveying in 2016, graduated from Ranger School in 17, and then I have three other degrees from Hobart. So my life has been years of studying for sure. So um, I'm a firm believer in doing and studying um, for any exam by Doing what you're going to be on the what's going to be on the exam. So how I approach any exam is to do practice exams, to do practice questions, to to be able to replicate that exam as best as possible. Um, I'm on my road to licensure, starting my application as we speak. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is I've kept every single homework exam project from Rainier School and I'm going to go through every single homework assignment, every single exam and replicate that and, and do all those exams and homeworks again um, to, to re-familiarize myself with those and what goes into it. Um, 
things to think about are time management, right? Got to manage your time of studying. Don't cram. Prepare, make a schedule for studying. Um, I like to study in groups. So what I'm doing is I'm getting a little study group together in this area. Kids I went to ranger school with that are on the road to licensure as well. And we're going to get together and study. I like that aspect of it because you can bounce ideas off each other. You can get some feedback of what is working for one person, what's not working for another person. Um, but my my biggest uh, thing that I can't stress enough is time management. Don't kill yourself in, in cramming at the end before that exam. Making that schedule to set a go, okay, I'm going to take a half hour, an hour, every day or two hours a week to, to study and, and really spend quality time doing what you're doing um, to making that goal of only studying, really put forth that energy and time to do so and figure out what works for you. You know, me, flashcards are great. Um, talking to people is great. You gotta figure out what works for you and that's hard sometimes and it takes some time to figure out and then once you get into that routine of what works well for you, stick with it um, and go into that exam with confidence um, that you can sit there and, and you are going to know the answers because you've put the work in. Um, one thing I always try to do is have 110% effort. So when I sit for that exam, I know that 90% of those questions I'm gonna have some experience with that question and have a pretty good idea how to answer, whether it's a written um, question, multiple choice question. To have that confidence going into that exam is everything. Um, that's what's helped me in the past. Uh, that really allowed me to shine during an exam. Um, that made it less stressful having that confidence going in. So it makes a huge that's difference. It. That's a great point, Keith. And I, and I think um, especially, I can tell from a personal experience, coming from the experience only route, there have been times in my career where, you know, you had to make the, you had to be confident in what you were doing because sometimes, sometimes you get hit with something that you're not really 100% sure on. Uh, you get nervous and the, the test, is definitely one of those items where you have an opportunity to study your butt off and feel confident when you go in. And a little tip, if you don't feel confident when you go in, be confident by the time you sit down because being nervous about it when you sit is not gonna make it easier. Yeah. Um, I just had the opportunity to, to sit for my exams um, and one of the things that I found, it's a very different format. The ensure that if, you, as you were preparing for your exams to reference the NCES website, go in, there is a practice, there is a practice, uh, what is it Keith, called? I think we're getting some feedback on your end. The practice exam, not only to, don't just do the practice exams for surveying, go on to the NCES website and do the practice exam that shows you how the format works. Um, the new computer-based format, it's not difficult. It actually has probably made the test a lot easier uh, in my regard, but it was unfamiliar. Um, it's still multiple choice, but just the navigation, make sure that all the things that you can prepare for are prepared for. Um, hey, Mike, want to speak to, uh, some, some of your experience in getting prepped for the exam? Sure. Um, I, everything that Keith told you to do, um, if I could go back in time, I would say, Keith, what should I do? Because I didn't do a single one of those things. Um, I'm, I'm not the best test taker. I've always crammed for things. Um, it worked somewhat until I started really getting into college. Um, exam prep experience, I 
I had, you know, Brown's boundary control and legal principles, and I had evidence and procedures, and uh, I was accepted to take the exam, and I got all these books, and I went for a vacation up in Maine for a week thinking, oh, this will be great. I can relax on the dock and take in the views and read, and uh, it, I, I didn't set myself up with a schedule, with a plan. I kind of just, I didn't have direction. I didn't have a mentor, so I kind of just was winging it. Um, I would say, don't do that. <laughs> um, figure out ways, especially for some of you on the on the call that are maybe more towards the beginning of your experience than the end of it. Look for ways to apply what you read in the books and what you what you take those practice exams. Look for ways to apply that in real life. Uh, I'm the kind of person that kind of learns on the fly. I, I need hands-on experience. I need to. I need to see something two or three times uh, before I really starts to sink in or I really start to remember and get it. And if I would have had uh, a little bit more experience doing a little bit more rough calculations in the field, if I would have had a little bit more experience reading something in Browns or reading something out of in New York State, if you're in a riparian area, you know, you're working with streams and creeks or tides or, or lakes, um, being able to apply what you read it, it, it's a life, it's a bit of a journey that you're going on. Don't don't cram for it the last year or two. You know, take your time, enjoy it, and, and apply what you learn and what you read every day. Um, it, it's hard, you know, as as a parent and a and and now a project manager trying to mentor my you know my kid and, and my 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 employees here. Um, it, it's hard for them, I think, to realize you you have to experience the failure. Or, or the setbacks in order to realize, you know what, maybe I should have done it that way from the beginning. Um, that's how I would prep for the exam. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait. I would do it, make it part of your life and, uh, and do it every day. Even if it's one little thing every day, you learn something new every day. It's something you didn't know yesterday. And then you take that and build off of it. Great points, Mike. Great points. And I, I think that really, really is a great opportunity. If you can, if you can, Take the opportunity to learn from the people who know better than you. Um, when something happens on a plat that you're unfamiliar with why it was done, ask the question. Um, I've always attributed my own personal success to understanding the right question to ask. And I only got that experience by asking a lot of the wrong questions first. So my advice is just ask questions. You're probably going to annoy a couple people. But most of the people will know that you're trying to do the right thing. So um, great, great advice there, Mike. Uh, one of the things that, that popped in here before we move on to our, our next section was how are the applications, what is the point of the application? So I think I can speak to this. And, and this question came in from Brian. And, and uh, Brian, if, if this question isn't, if I'm not answering this the way that you want, please be, feel free to shoot over uh, a clarification for that. And also, we're, as we're getting a little close towards the end of our, our presentation, I would encourage anybody who's on, on the, uh, the line to shoot a question over. Um, we'd be more than happy to, to at least discuss it. And if we can't get to all of the questions, um, we would like to, to follow up and, and really um, make sure we get these things approved for it. Uh, not approved, answered for you. Um, so, how do you, how, what is the application for? If you have graduated and meet the education requirements to sit for your FS exam, you may do so. At that point, you then have to put your application together to be approved to take the PS test. If you are taking the experience only route, you must put your application together and submit it and get approved in order to sit for both the FS and the PS. Um, I hope that's clear. The education requirement uh, relieves you of having to fill out your application ahead of time. And you still must fill that out in order to take that PS. If you are, if you are experience only, you need to have an approved application to sit for either exam. Um, Nick, you would know better than I. That that hit everything. 
Yeah, what you said is accurate. If you're within 20 credits credit hours of graduating uh, from a four-year program, then you can just jump right in to the fundamentals of surveying exam. So that's exactly what I did. I didn't fill out my application until I was ready to take the PS from the state specific. Perfect. Yeah, and, and my experience was different. I I went in, I filled out an application, I got back my my first, I got the you need one more year of experience from the board. Uh, two years later, I filled out the I finished the application again, sent it in, and got approval to sit for both my FS and PS. Uh, which I would not have been able to do prior to that approval. Um, great, awesome. So one of the things that comes up, as I told you, um, I put in my application the first time and, and got denied, which I don't think is a unique uh, thing on this call or for any of the people that you probably work for. Um, standard fare, you put that application in and the board reviews and tells you whether there's two responses that I've heard of. There's congratulations, you can sit for all your exams, or they come back and they, they give you an explanation of how much more experience you need and in what particular areas. Um, obviously, it's one of those things where you, you come to realize that, oh, I needed more experience in X, Y, or Z. Um, Jason, is there anything that, that you can add to that in really you know, handling some of those setbacks and, and maybe just some encouraging words to? Uh, to help people get by on here. Absolutely, um, and it's a great dovetail um, on everybody's stories about um, their study habits and being confident to take that test because you'll have the knowledge um, to take your your fundamentals and your principles, and then your state specific. So once you once you apply. And you, you think you got it all down, you really padded that application with all of your experience, a board is then going to review it and you may get that letter and response that says, you have too much of this, we want to see more of that. And that could be as simple as, you know, the way you have your experience crafted. That's why that's very important. All the elements that we've already discussed, it's very important to word it correctly um, when you are putting that into your application. And once you get approved and you go to sit for that exam, it, it, the exam is what it is. It's, it's an all day affair, two days in a row. It's very, very thorough. And you will walk out of there tired and you may, you know, during that, that, during the taking of the test, you may run across questions that I don't really know this, I don't really know that. And then you get the results back and you find out that you didn't pass all three parts or or any or one or two whatever it is don't let that get you down that not everybody passes all three their first time around it, it's not an indicator of you not having the knowledge it's a it's a very arduous exam so don't be dismayed if you're if you have that confidence and you have the desire to be a licensed land surveyor. Just reapply and um, focus on whatever it was, whatever you're able to glean from what you thought you were deficient in. Focus on that. Me personally, I was one of those kids in the math class that said, I'm never going to need geometry or this. I'm never going to need it. I'm just going to take the general math or not go beyond algebra. And here I am every day using it and had to go back and teach myself that. So, um, but I never, I never let it get, get me down. I did reapply and I passed and here I am as a sole proprietor and it just, Stay focused, stay confident, you will get there. And that's and that's awesome advice, Jason. I think that's it's advice that everyone needs to hear. Um, none of this is easy. Um, there's I don't think there's any any licensed person on this call or a licensed person you're gonna speak to who's gonna tell you that any part of this was easy. The experience part is tough, the school part is tough, the application is tough, and the exams are all tough, and they're meant to be. So don't be hard on yourself. 
just be confident and be hardworking. Don't be hard on yourself. Um, Ashley, I know you are, you are in the process. So I wonder, is there any way that you are setting yourself up preparation wise or organization wise uh, that you could share that, that maybe some of the folks on the line would uh, be able to, to do as well? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing so far being so early into the process of, you know, looking at the application, not even filling it out, just going online, seeing what it actually is. I had to print it out the first time and read it five times over just to understand what they're asking for. Um, but I think one of the most confidence boosting things that I was able to do was to get involved here at Nice Apples and especially with the Young uh, Professionals Committee was because I found like-minded people and it much it broadened my view of you know there's a couple people here in Clifton Park I work here at MJ Engineering we have a couple of professional licensed land surveyors and I was able to bounce off ideas from them but then when I entered you know nice apples and I was able to talk to people from across the state I understood that there's a lot more people out there who I'm able to get ideas off of or even just have a conversation with um, and I think this this podcast that we're doing here or just sitting down and having a discussion is a fantastic way just to get get the information out there but also to just have a conversation about you know, everybody goes through the same process. If you have questions, don't just sit there. Just talk about it. It's something that um, we really focused on in the women's panel was that you need to talk to people. You need to reach out. Everybody's going through the same thing. You just need to be able to have a conversation, learn something, take something from it, and move forward. And I certainly think that if you join in to any uh, committee here at Nice Apples that you'd be able to certainly branch out your uh, your networking. Uh, that's awesome, Ashley. I appreciate that, and I and I think it's it's really true. Um, the big thing that kept me for the longest time was I was nervous. I thought I was going to walk into a room with licensed professionals who were going to judge me on what I did or what I knew. And guess what? That wasn't what I experienced. I experienced, I walked into my first board of directors meeting terrified, absolutely terrified, because everyone sitting at that table has, was a licensed surveyor sitting in a suit. And guess what? I sat there, I said my piece in a little bit of a cracked voice because um, I was so nervous. And every meeting since that day, and also that meeting, has been the support of every person who is in that room. They are interested in what I do. They are interested in how I move through my career and they are interested in helping me get there. Um, and I think that is a huge person, uh, excuse me, a huge benefit that any one of you can take on. Find a group of people who are interested in what you do and those people will help encourage you to get where you need to be. Um, Nick, we have just a few minutes left, but I know one of the big things that you were speaking about was preparation for your exam. Um, can you touch on that just in a few minutes, just before we leave? One of the things yeah. I'm going to say, just in case we run out of time, please, please, please fill in your comments, fill out the comment sheets, fill out our survey. We want to know what it is that you guys want to hear about. Maybe you want to hear more about this or a specific topic. Shoot us questions send us comments. We would like this to be something that we can do for all you folks out there. Um, and we're gonna have other people. This isn't just gonna be the same faces every, every time on here. We're hoping to mix it up and get the people who know the best about the topics you wanna hear, we're gonna get them on. Um, looking forward to that. Nick, I'm gonna let you take it away. Um, speaking about those best practices for exams. Sure, and I'm gonna talk about my own experiences uh, first with the FS or Fundamentals of Surveying Exam, the first one, programmed HP 35. It's really the only way to go. Uh, I teach HP 35 programs in my Survey 1, Survey 2 courses just because I want students to be exposed to this. Um, 
when it came time for the PS or professional surveyors exam and the state specific exam, I took the Nice Apples state specific review course and I would recommend that highly. I would recommend that to anyone and everyone. And even though it's geared towards the state specific, having that kind of refresher course for me going into the professional surveyors exam as well was really beneficial. And another benefit of that review course is they actually give you material. They give you a, a binder full of nice, good, uh, summarized topics that you can bring into that state specific exam because that's an open book exam. When I took the state specific, one of my reference materials was Black's Law Dictionary. And that turned out to be my probably number one resource. It was the, the book that I was opening the most during that exam. And there were specific questions where I was able to flip to the word in the law dictionary, read right across the uh, definition, and know that I had the correct answer right then and there. Other than that, I think what Keith talked about as far as having exam confidence is important. And you know, confidence isn't something <clears throat> that you can just magically generate. It's got to be built off of something. But I think what really helps me is that all three exams are multiple choice. And I really appreciate knowing that there is a correct answer somewhere on this page. It's just up to me to find it. That's what gives me exam confidence when I go to sit down for those types of exams. That's great. And that's it's a, it's a great point to make is that at least when you don't know the answer, you can still pick an answer. <laughs> um, one of the other big things, listen, if uh, you have an opportunity, try to get the conference. This past year, we had a conference virtually, and there was a ton of information and educational sessions. Uh, those types of opportunities come around and are provided by Nice Apples pretty regularly. Um, take them up on it. You know, hopefully, you can get an employer yourself, and again, uh, to get to conference. And also, there's more and more now of the virtual education. Um, I would encourage everybody jump on that. And if you're you're studying for your exam and you don't have a copy of the surveyor reference manual, you haven't started yet. <laughs> um, being mindful of everyone's time, we are going to wrap up. I hope everybody who joined us today, all of you, found this to be informative, found it to be informational, took something away from it. What I would love, and I'd love nothing more, please provide your comments to us because we don't want to do this if you don't want it. We want to do this and we want to give you what you want. Um, so if you can fill those comments out for us, give us ideas, tell us what's good, what's bad, what you'd like to see. That's what's really important for us because we, we enjoy doing this. We enjoy working for you. We're here on a committee of our own volunteer time to try to move the profession forward and specifically the profession of our young professionals. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing from you and hope that this was beneficial and we can uh, provide this in the future. Heather, I know you have some parting words and I'll, I'll drop it to you. Yes, well, thank you to everyone that's attended today and a big thank you to our Young Professionals Committee for their time and dedication to the organization. As Tim mentioned, a short evaluation will be sent out by email um, shortly after this presentation. Please take the time to fill it out so that you can provide feedback to our Young Professionals Committee. Thank you all for attending and have a great weekend. Thank you.